Michael Snyder, and I'm a uh, PhD student from the University of Louisville, and I also have an undergrad degree in physics from Murray State University. And my talk today is named uh, Magnetic Rainbows, and magnetism has nothing to do with my talk today. Uh, basically, I've been giving these talks every year, and I've decided to just to talk about something different, so I looked into encryption. Okay, so the idea is, you know, if you knew how to uh, program C++ and you wanted to keep your connection secure, how would you do it? Now, of course, a mathematician would do it much differently than what an engineer would do. And I've had training in both, so mine's kind of a little bit of both, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And let me just say if I've made any naive mistakes, uh, I'm used to it. It's not a big deal. Uh, uh, hopefully, there would still be some contribution, even if uh, you know, first line of my code is wrong. Okay, it helps to turn it on. Part one: security protocol. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about five minutes, just hand waving and explaining what it's doing. And then I have a pre-recorded uh, segment I'll play. So let me just start with that. Okay, so my security protocol, and like I, I said, it could be a naive attempt, is I want a way to use an XOR key to encrypt my data. And hopefully the audience knows how XOR gates work. That, you know, if you XOR, uh, a XOR B produces one, and if you take one and you XOR B again, you get A back. So you, you cannot lose information as long as you know what the XOR key is. And the problem is, you know, how can the client pass the key to the server, or how can the server pass the key to the client without somebody seeing it? Because if they see it, you know, that defeats the whole purpose. And how I did it is, I start with a known XOR key, and the server and the client is synchronized. And then the server has what I call a permutation mask. So it takes a mask and it looks at the bits of the key, and it changes a few of the bits, so it permutates the key. Now the client does not know the new key. So you know, the client's watching this conversation, everything's decoding just right, and suddenly it stops decoding. So the client, what it does is it checks every known permutation. And how does it know the permutations ahead of time? Because it actually created the permutation mask and passed it to the key, or passed it to the server. So uh, long story short, what happens is servers in sync, clients in sync, server changes the key, client figures out the key's been changed, it searches for the key, now, once it finds that key, it, you know, you have a moment of security. The server has a new key, the client has a new key, and it's never been on the wire. And at that moment, you use the new key to pass a whole new set of parameters to the server. And that's my basic concept. And we'll start the, uh, the recording I have for you. Good morning, Freaknik. My name is Michael Snyder, and I'm here to give the 10 o'clock talk. Um, my talk is about magnetic rainbows, and uh, I have an undergrad degree from Murray State University in physics. And I also am a PhD student at the University of Louisville. Okay, the first part of my talk is Snyder's security protocol. And this is just a little uh, protocol that I came up with. Uh, I think it will increase encryption. And it's at layer four, so we can use everything we already have. We can just add another one to it. Well, you copied my code. 
way they'd like a copy? Why do we need a new security protocol? Well, basically, computers have gotten more powerful, which means the more, no, the more powerful the computers get, the less secure our old encryption is. Uh, it's basically Moore's Law. And there's some possible strategies that we're not using now that we could use. And basically, I just want to go over the strategies. Now, the encryption that the most common encryption is based on factoring large numbers. And, you know, we see this a lot in public key encryptions. Now, there's nothing wrong with factoring large numbers. What I'm pointing out is there's many other ways of doing this. You know, we're just solving one, math one mathematical problem. There's a whole list of mathematical problems we could be solving instead, instead, you know, instead of just factoring large numbers. So to me, you know, the factoring large numbers is just the low-hanging fruit. There, there are many other choices. Next slide. Now the present encryption is like the, the Great Wall of China. You know, it's very tall and it's very long and it's very secure as long as you don't happen to get, guess the, uh, the large number that was being factored. Uh, some things to notice. Notice that if the wall is broken at any point, and uh, if the security is penetrated at any point, then it doesn't do any good. And I think the, uh, the Chinese found that out a, a few thousand years ago. It's a great idea, and it does work, but it has some significant downsides. Now, when things go wrong, they go really wrong with the present technology, the present encryption technology. Next slide. Now, we already know possible solutions to this. You know. Now, with the present technology, if you break it, then you get keys to the kingdom. You know, it, there is no uh, there's no second chance. You know, we're putting all of our uh, chicks in one basket, or all of our eggs in one basket. Now, there's another way of doing this, and we we know from evolution that diversity is the solution to adversity. And basically, what that says is, you know, when things are going wrong, you want to try every possible solution. And that's exactly what evolution does. It tries every possible solution. That's why I'm standing here right now. I'm one of the possible solutions it came up with. Okay, Snyder Security Protocol is a application layer for XOR, XOR encoding. And I'm assuming a connection full TCP, which basically means I don't want to deal with uh, missing packets uh, we'll let the lower level protocols take care of that. And the way I'm envisioning this, uh, it would be transparent to all the low level uh, encryption. You know, you could run your regular VPN at one level, run your SSH at another level, and this would be on, on top of those two, and uh, basically uh, just be another layer of encoding. Next slide, please. Now, the visual image I want to use for my encryption is instead of a big wall, you know, that has uh, places, that, you know, any, where everybody knows where the weakness is, I'm using a infinite series of speed bumps, where each speed bump, the encryption's not that strong, but it's independent from the next speed bump, which is independent from the next speed bump. In other words, if you hack into speed bump one, that doesn't give you the keys to speed bump two. You still have to do that work. So on the regular, on the regular encryption, the um, you know, if you break into the, the castle, you get everything inside the castle. With my encryption, eh, you break into, you know, you break past the speed bump. Uh, there's another one waiting for you. Now you might get you know, a few packets, but you're not getting the whole data stream, which is the goal. Next slide, please. So the 
status quo encryption makes a super duper key and hides it. Never ever puts it on the wire. Uh, my key, my security protocol says, screw it, make a whole lot of keys and use each key one time. You know, one use keys. And if somebody guesses one, you no, know, if somebody gets one of them, it's okay. You know, uh, my data stream might be 10,000 packets long. And if somebody guesses a key and gets five packets, I'm not worried about it. Next slide, please. So instead of a, you know, a, a big wall that nobody can get through, and they also have to know where all the weaknesses are, we have a infinite series of small roadblocks, small speed bumps. And just because you break into one part of it, doesn't mean you get another part of it. You know, they're all independent uh, tests or levels of a video game, if you want to think of it that way. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is my basic code. And what I did was I just took my ideas and I wrote them down in C++ format. The uh, code, you know, I won't go line by line, but I, I will tell you in general what it's doing. Basically, I'm starting on the server side with a uh, hexadecimal key, and I'm using it as an XOR key, which uh, XOR, you know, you can take A, XOR it with B, and it produces a value. If you take that B value and XOR it with A, you'll get B back. Uh, basically, you can't lose any information by using an XOR key. So I'm taking an XOR key, and I'm just, uh, permutating it. I'm just um, taking a mask and um, changing it. And the client computer, we'll go to the next slide, and this is more of the server side. We'll go to the client side, so which is the next slide. Uh, on the client side, the uh, client watches for this permutation to happen. And you know, the, so the server's talking to the client, and they both are in sync. And then randomly the server changes the key. And then the client has to try all the possibilities to find the key. Um, this is very similar to having a conversation with somebody and they change the subject. And then you, you, know, you have to use all, all that mental processing power to find the subject they're talking about. So this is the same idea. You know, the server's talking to the client. The server changes the key and the client notice, notices, and then the client has to find the new key. Now once the client finds the new key, it does something very special. It generates a whole set of uh, security key parameters, uh, and hands them, and then codes the new key. Now remember, the new key has never been on the wire. The server knows the new key, the client found the new key. So the, the server uh, changed it, the client found it, it uses the new key, makes up a whole new set of security parameters, including another XOR key, and transmits it to the server immediately. So we have, you no know, server changed the key, client found it, client made a new key, client transfers it to the server. We have a lot of good things going on here. The first thing being that the server has used very little CPU power. Now, using XOR keys and changing an XOR key is minimal uh, CPU power. The client has used quite a bit of CPU power, and we want that to happen. Now, let me explain why. Imagine you're an eavesdropper, and you're trying to figure out what this you know, conversation is going on. Now, if you can just listen to the, you know, the client side and the server side, and you know, the server side takes one CPU unit, and the client side takes one CPU unit, then the eavesdropper only has to spend two CPU units to decode it in real time. But we don't want the eavesdropper to decode it in real time. So if the server side uses one CPU unit, and the client side uses seven CPU units, then that's a whole different ballgame, because then the the eavesdropper has to use eight CPU units to listen to it in real time, which means if he's listening to thousands of conversations, he has to pick and choose which conversation he wants to listen to. 
Perfect. So basically, you know, your iPhone and your other devices, even at their slowest CPU speeds, uh, still have surplus CPU power. So by putting some of the encryption load on the client side and not on the server side, we help ourselves in many ways. Next slide. Now, just using my security protocol as it is written in those four pages, I think would be you know a big, uh, a significant change for the better. But there's a lot of other things we can do that we're not necessarily doing now. So uh, this slide is called extras, and then we'll look at the other things we can do. Okay, so my idea, one of the extras we can do is standardized non-standardization. And what that means is basically we don't want to do everything the same. We don't want to do it the same way other people are doing it. You know, if they're using a 56-bit uh, key, we want to use a 64-bit key. Or if they're using, uh, you know, message digest, uh, uh, MD5, we want to use S SHA. We want to do things differently all the time for more security. And uh, one way of doing that, especially, you know, in my protocol, I need to pick a new XML key because I don't use them very long, is... Uh, just coming up with, with a bunch of different functions that produces integers. Next slide, please. For example, if we just take the integer f uh, function of the timestamp, uh, we would just, you know, we would get the timestamp in seconds, and that's a big long number, and we could use that as XOR key. Now, of course, using the timestamp as a XOR key has a downside that the eavesdropper may try that and figure out what you're doing. But there's other choices. What if I take a random number between 0 and 1, multiply it by 1,000, and add it to the timestamp, and just take the uh, integer value of that value? You, you know, so that's a, a known number plus a random number, which would be pretty hard to figure out. But there's other choices. For example, let's take the, uh, the sign of the timestamp and add it to a random number between zero and a thousand and take the integer value of that. You know, so the sign of the timestamp is very interesting because it cycles over and over again. And of course the random number is random, so that's a pretty good way of producing a random key. But there's other choices. For example, let's take the timestamp in seconds and take the square root of it, which will produce another number, divide it by five, and add 4.5 to it, and then take the integer sequence of that. Now, can we do that? Yes. Uh, could the eavesdropper figure out, you know, how you're generating that XOR key? Maybe they could, but uh, that's no big deal because, you know, there's another way of doing it. Maybe I'll take the timestamp and raise it to a random number between 0 and 1. Now, that will also produce a random number. Now. I'm not suggesting that we use any one of these ideas. What I'm suggesting is to having a big, long uh, library list of all these possible functions, including user libraries, you know, including user uh, entries. Okay, let me stop it there because when I was making the recording, I forgot to talk about my, uh, my video game I'm playing there. Okay. So to finish that slide, basically I can imagine you know, a, a text file that has 23 different functions that can generate a, a sequence, sequence of integers. And for an XOR key, all you need is a sequence of integers. Now, of course, you don't want the, the eavesdropper to figure out which one you're using, so the solution is to use one line at a time. So you know, the computer says, I need a new key, so it picks line 15 and generates one. And then next time it needs a key, it picks line 21. So even if, the, even if the eavesdropper has a record of every key you've ever used, it doesn't know good because you're using so many different permutations from the possible functions. Oh, the other idea, and some, maybe some of you played Eve. I, I play a space game where you fly around in a big spaceship and shoot people. But everybody's... <coughs> spaceship is different and how it works is you know you just pick a module you know 
Um, let's see if I have a laser pointer here. You just pick, I uh, you know, I have five different guns here. And I just drop them, it's a GUI. So I, I take this gun, drop it here, and take this GUI, or take this uh, armor and put it there. Now, what, the reason it's in the slide is this is a great example of a non-standardized standardization because everybody can have a different ship that does different things, but it's all in modules that's easy to uh, manage. <coughs> so imagine you had a encryption interface like this, where you can just say, I want to use S SHA and just drop it into the GUI. And then I want to use this user library that my friend gave me that has 5,000 functions that makes XOR keys. You just click on it and drop it into the GUI. Can, uh, some questions on that. Did, are you the one that came up with the idea of an XOR encryption key? Is that something that's well, existed before? XOR has been around forever. Right. Uh, but, RAID 5. Right. So, but I'm trying to understand this. I'm not really a math person. So, the what is happening on the re remote side? They're taking your same keys that they're using right. and they're decrypting it as they go. Okay. And so, it's flowing across the line, changed each time? I think Sorry. I might understand what he's saying. Okay. It's, it's kind of like the kids' game Guess Who? Yeah. You, you know, you have the, the same people on one side and different same people on the other. And so there's some sort of little hint and the client side then has to guess which character, which, which encryption model he's using. He's got a series of recipes. He goes and pulls a recipe. Well, I'm going to take timestamp is what he used. That's our basic ingredient. And then we're going to square root that and divide it by five or divide it by some random number or we're going to... You know, so we're taking some sort of math, and then this client side is having to do a lot of extra work to figure out what the math is that the server side is giving to them so that they can then generate a bunch of extra keys to pass back. How do they keep it straight? That's the, <laughs> that's the trick in yeah. encryption. Now, encryption is very easy. Now, if I write down a 16-digit number and hand it to you, and you go home and you punch it into your machine that says uh, that all the data, use this 16-bit number or 16-byte number, and then uh, use XOR on it and send it to me. And then I can decode it because I have the number. So encryption using XOR, which I guess is probably the standard, uh, is very easy if you can synchronize your keys. But the problem is, how do you synchronize your keys without an eavesdropper knowing? And that's what I'm trying to fix. It, yes? Um, related, how, how does it know that it's successfully decrypted that's, that's probably the, the most important question you could ask, and that will be on the last slide. Okay. Uh, you, you may be able to figure it out as we go. Uh, that's, the, and then the most, okay, you got two things that you need to do. You need to synchronize the keys, and you need to figure out when they're not synchronized. And that's what my code's mostly working on. And then the computer randomly picks one every time it generates a key. Now remember the server has no preference on what keys get passed to it. it it'll use any parameters that's uh, passed to it. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, in this slide we have a bunch of, uh, you know, a bunch of duct decoys. And basically um, the idea I'm trying to express is in my code you know, on the client side, the, the server is using a key, and then the server changes the key, and the client notices, and then the client searches through all the possibilities. And the client knows all the possibilities because the previously it had passed those possibilities to the server. Okay, so imagine the client searches through all the possible permutations and uh, doesn't find the answer. Now, what does the client do? Well, one possibility is just for them to drop the packet like it never received it. And that's a really nasty thing to do to the eavesdropper. So the eavesdropper really doesn't know the permutation window. You know, it doesn't know how big a set of permutations to check. And if you make a packet that does not meet this, the, the, the requirement that it, you know, it's encoded with a MD5 value. If you make a packet that has the wrong MD5 a value for every possibility, then the client will just kick it out. You know, it'll try the limited sets of cho the limited choices, and after every choice is tried, it'll kick it out. 
but the eavesdropper won't know that. So the, the eavesdropper keeps trying more and more and more XOR keys. Uh, this is a, you know, a pretty nasty thing to do to the eavesdropper. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Another possibility is what if you, uh, what if you uh, open a few tunnels? Instead of one encrypted tunnel, maybe have three or four encrypted tunnels. And then this, you know, using round, uh, round robin, uh, pass those encrypt, pass the data to different encrypted tunnels at different times. Uh, as long as the client knows what tunnel to look for, for you know how to resequence the data, you know there's no problem. We could do this very easily. Now imagine you're an eavesdropper, and you want to hear the whole conversation. Well, if you if you just focus on any one tunnel, you don't get the whole conversation. So this, this is meant to be a logistic nightmare. And it, you know, you could do the same thing with a single tunnel by reordering the packets. Now if it's bulk data and you don't care, and the client knows how to resequence the packets, then you can you know, mess up the sequence on the one hand on the server side and reorder the sequence on the client side, with the downside being the latency. Uh, but a lot of data protocols don't care about latency, but some do. Next slide, please. Okay, so basically, you know, we're looking at an infinite set of uh, speed bumps. And each speed bump, you know, the client makes up the uh, communication parameters and passes them to the server. And the server will do whatever, you know, the, the client passes it. It will, you know, use this whatever key, whatever permutation window, and so forth. So that brings up the question, you know, can we increase our security by using this independence. You know, most of the time you don't have this freedom to, to, to completely change a key. And that's what this next slide is about. Next slide, please. So can we change key sizes on the fly? For example, can the first speed bump be uh, 64 bits uh, XOR key? And can the next one be 128 bits uh, XOR key? And could we change back and forth? Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, my security protocol doesn't care. You know, the server will, uh, when it gets the, its instructions from the client, it will use any XOR key it's, you know, it's given, and it will use any uh, permutation mask that it's given. Uh, it's basically, you know, it's a computer. It will follow the instructions that's given it, which means we can change key sizes on the fly, which could you imagine how frustrating that would be on somebody who's trying to decode your packets. You know, on one, once, not only did we change the key, but we changed the key size, you know, from one packet to the next. Another possibility is can we use odd size keys? I mean, have you ever heard of using 73 bits or uh, 52 bits? Uh, well, well, 52 would be an even number, but even uh, 53 bits. Now, can we use odd size keys? And the answer is yes. Now, the code gets a little ugly because you have to use bit operators instead of byte operators. But if we imagine a data stream as a sequence of bits instead of a sequence of bytes, then we can use you know, 127 bits as a key, which would completely mess up your, your byte boundaries. But assuming the client knows how to reconstruct the byte boundaries, it's not a big deal. So, uh, in other words, could you imagine being an e eavesdropper and somebody's using 73 bits instead of a, a no, 74 or an, or an even number? That would make it very hard to decode. Oh, what's the maximum size key we can use? Well, if we know the size of the packet already, and let's assume that we're using 1,500-byte uh, packets, then the maximum key size that the, the uh, client can transmit to the server is, surprisingly, uh, 1,500 bytes. We can use very large keys. There's really, you know, the, the, the packet size and the key size are basically, the maximum key size is the packet size. Uh, next slide, please. Now, all this effort, you know, why should we make all this effort to prevent an eavesdropper from listening to our work or, or data. 
And the answer is that there's many eavesdroppers out there, and information is power. So imagine that you know you, you love your government and you want to share all your data with your government. And I, I have no problem with that. But it's not just your government government listening on the internet. There's China, there's India, there, there's you know economic reasons to listen uh, for data. There's military reasons to listen for data. Uh, you know, it, it comes back that you know information is power and power corrupts. You know, there's really no way around that. You know, imagine if you were a person who could have all the world's information at your fingertips. Would you use that information correctly? Uh, I probably would not. So, in a long story short, you can always make the case that it is disloyal to allow other governments to eavesdrop on your conversation. You know, if you love the USA, it is disloyal to let China listen to my conversations, and vice versa. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is one of those memes from the internet. It says, a nation of sheep will beget a government of wolves. And uh, the only change I would make is put S on the governments. And uh, so a nation of sheep will beget a, many governments of wolves. Uh, we really need to protect our data just to stop the temptation of other people to see our data. Okay, next slide, please. This is the summary page for part one. And basically, you know, in my summary, we're saying that not all encryption has to be built on factoring uh, large numbers. There's many other ways of doing things than factoring large numbers. Uh, my security protocol is based on the time, of, the time it takes to solve the following problem. Now, I have a data seg segment. I have an MD5 value, which is a message di uh, digest value which is calculated from the data segment. And then I encapsulate both with a unknown XOR key. And then the client has to find that XOR key. Uh, and by finding that key, then it gives it a moment of security where it can transmit a new key to the server and then the process repeats. So this is just a different kind of math problem. You know, I have a data segment, I have a message digest value, and I have both of them wrapped up with a um, key. Now you can think of this, and you know, if you squint your eyes just right, you can think of the uh, MD5 value as an eigenvalue. You can think of the, the key, the unknown key, as a eigenvector. And you can think of the data segment as a data matrix. Uh, so in this you know, basically I took some ideas from quantum mechanics and just applied them to this basic uh, uh, encryption uh, problem. Okay, so let me, let me expand on this. This is probably the most important slide I have in my presentation. And it's just, it's using stuff we already know, but it's using it in a different way. So imagine I have a data segment in my left hand, or your right. So I have a data segment. And I take the MD5 value, and the MD5 values are very, uh, uh, MD5 is not the most secure protocol, but it's a pretty good one-to-one uh, -one ratio. Uh, you, you can't fake it out very easily. So I have a data segment, I get an MD5 value, and I record that value in the packet. And then I send it to the, now say the server sending it to the client. Oh, and the other thing I did is I applied a key. So the, the client gets it. it, it takes the key that it thinks it, thinks it should work and de tries to decode the packet. Now here's the magic. If the client has the wrong key, the client's MD5 value of the data segment will not match the MD5 value that's recorded in the packet. And the only way you can get that condition to be true is by finding the right key. So it, this is a very, um, is a very, I think it's a clever way of figuring out that if we have our keys synchronized or not. And if, you, if you're not synchronized, then you can do Y, and if you are synchronized, you can do X. So that, this is the, the whole centerpiece of my security protocol. 
uh, any questions at this point? Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, that's the end of part one. And I don't have enough time to start part two, so we'll have to save that for next year. So here's the uh, last slide. And uh, basically, if you have any questions, you can email me at msnyder, that's M-S-N-Y-D-E-R, at revolution-labs.com. And if you liked my presentation, uh, please send a few dollars my way. And that's the GoFundMe site. And my uh, URL is ZA86D8WG. And I want to thank you for being my audience. And I look forward to seeing you next year. And thank you. I have a question. Yes. So is, the, is your method, is it still susceptible to Moore's Law? I mean, as faster computers or a listener would go, they could still attack it faster, more frequently, and try a lot of keys, right? Yes and no. Uh, yes, Moore's Law will always affect what we're doing, yeah. but the, the, the idea is that the server's not really doing any thinking. The, the server's really just following the instructions that's created by the client, and we're using those moments of security to, to sneak the instructions from the client to the server. Okay, that said, this, the client can adapt its CPU load any way it wants to. It can make the permutation mask bigger, it can make the permutation mask smaller, so, and there's really no way for the eavesdropper, eaves, eavesdropper to uh, notice uh, because, of course, the data is encrypted. So you could have an i7 maxed out, you know, producing all this heat on the client side. The server is, has no CPU load at all, and you could have a very secure connection just by turning up the CPU power on the client. So in that sense, it protects it from Moore's Law because the client will always be more powerful as new clients come about. Questions? What made you think of this? Um, well, I've had a lot of training. Uh, I started out with, uh, uh, many years ago, I was a CCSP. Security professional for Cisco, and then since then I've done many other things, including including going to college. Sorry to keep asking, but um, so have you written a paper and sent it to any of the major cryptology? Oh, is it, is it, uh, no, because even even I mean I think I have some clever ideas, but there's people that make you know this is their lives and they they, they do this every day and they probably would think my code is probably uh, naive. But I just wanted to show that you know anybody can write a security protocol if they try. Any other questions? I would love to hear you speak about how you got quantum mechanics, how that ties into this. Oh, that may be a little bit long. The um, there's a lot of problems in quantum mechanics where you have a data matrix times a vector produces a scalar value. And after I finished, I, looked, I realized, hey, we could say the MD5 is a scalar value, we could say the key is a vector, and we could say that the data segment is a matrix. And so it was just kind of an, af an afterthought. Uh, when I got done, I realized that it took that form. Can you put your email address back up there? Sure. Uh, let's see. Actually, it's in the program. Oh, okay. It's in, oh, it's in the, uh, the Freaknik program. Okay, all right. Okay, well, I want to thank you for being my audience, and I, I look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you. Thanks.